Well, then I think uh, we will also start if we uh, start the recording. So um, good afternoon to uh, everybody. Uh, I see also uh, quite some uh, faces outside of uh, our informal circle at the university, so welcome. Uh, my name is Kati Ceres, and um, I'm very glad to uh, moderate uh, this afternoon's talk. Uh, this is in the series of sustainable global economic law. And our uh, speaker today is Michelle uh, Mar. So let me introduce her uh, to you and um, welcome you, Michelle, and very happy to, uh, to have you in this uh, series of talk. Um, you gave us, uh, at least uh, those of us who uh, read uh, your book, a little introduction yourself, actually from your teenage uh, years. <laughs> so let me start uh, with there, because I think it's a little bit part of the story and uh, what you are going to share with us. So you were a true teenage conservative who uh, was a pro thatcher uh, firm believer in free markets and the power of uh, competition which I think, uh, as you um, wrote it down, also uh, defined your later career path and education. So you have been working um, in private practice at uh, large international law firms, but also on the regulator side, um, on the regulatory side of, of markets, such as the UK's Office for Fair Trading, and also the US uh, Federal Trade Commission, as well as uh, the World Bank. And I'm sure you will tell us something about those years or that year, which I think is 2013, when many things in your private uh, life, but also uh, in your thinking about markets and the competition has changed. So you left the field, um, but you have not left it completely. And um, I, I would like to actually cite from your book how you returned uh, to the field, because as you say, you saw an opportunity uh, to materially change the way we regulate markets in order to address the need to reorient all our systems towards sustainability in all its meanings. And actually, this is the sentence why we invited you, because this uh, series is, is truly about sustainability in various way of, um, meanings. And we are very uh, curious to uh, learn about your thoughts, how that can be given uh, shape today. So you return to the field, um, and currently you are, um, Michelle is a senior policy uh, fellow at uh, University College uh, London, the Center for Law, Economics, and Society. And perhaps even more importantly, uh, she's a co-founder of Inclusive Competition Forum. And perhaps uh, your prime identity and place of work today is uh, the Balanced Economic Project, um, where Michelle is also a, a co-founder. So very warm welcome. We are looking forward uh, to your talk, uh, your radical ideas about markets, about power, and how to democratize that power within and outside of uh, the company and markets. So thank you, and the floor is yours. Fabulous. Um, thank you so much, Cassie, for this kind invitation. I'm really thrilled to be there and be here with you and only um, disappointed not to be there in, in, in Amsterdam. Um, so I'm going to bring up my slides and hopefully that will work and we will be on our way. Um, no, that hasn't worked. Hang on one second. Let's see. It was so nice in practice. Let's see. Okay, can you see that now? Yes, I see people nodding, so that's good. Okay, um, so the topic of my talk today is what is the purpose of competition policy? Um, and it may not be a question that many of you have asked yourselves, but it is one that I've spent quite some years asking myself um, over the last few years. And it's one that um, people who are working directly in competition law and competition policy have also been asking themselves, especially in the last two or three years. And when I come to this, as Katy mentioned, this is a kind of personal story or a personal journey for me. Um, and when I come to this question of what is the purpose of competition policy, um, I would like to put out there two competing visions. So one is the purpose of competition policy is investigating niche market failures um, and approving mergers. 
So this is the kind of system in which um, people, people who are working as private practice lawyers or regulators are operating within. But I don't think that many people who are working within that system would describe it that way. Um, and certainly that's not what motivated me to get into the area of competition law. I was drawn to competition law with this much grander vision, vision two, which is this idea that competition policy structures markets in the public interest. And it's a very specific understanding of the public interest, as um, as Cathy mentioned, that I, I believed, which was this kind of very, um, you know, uh, neoclassical, neoliberal um, public interest as equated to, you know, free markets and allocative efficiency and, and all of those things. And the structuring the markets was to be done in a very um, hands off way. So it was a deregulatory kind of model. It was this idea that, you know, the competition authorities would intervene in very specific circumstances just to tweak what was otherwise a very um, successful capitalist system. And I write about in the in the, my book that um, that Cathy uh, just quoted from competition is killing us. Um, I write about my kind of light bulb moment, the real the moment when I realized that there are these two visions and that they are radically divergent and I wasn't actually working in the vision that I thought I was. I was actually working not in vision two, structuring markets for the public interest, but actually in this vision one. Um, and the kind of personal scenario um, uh, from 2013 is I was at the time working for a, a magic circle law firm in London. Um, and I describe in, in the book, I was working particularly on a, a, a major um, merger between two fizzy drinks companies. And you might say that that's a kind of a funny um, a merger or example to, on which to kind of suddenly have a transformative moment in your career. But the point was that it was kind of a classic understanding of this is what you know free markets do, that companies will come together, they will identify all their brilliant efficiencies, they will tell a story to the regulators, and I was part of telling that story about why um, such a merger would be good, why it would lead to lower prices, why it would lead to better fizzier drinks or, or whatever. Um, and that was the system working well. That was my part in the system. What I kind of had a sudden in, uh, insight into was that we don't really want um, these fizzy drinks to be fizzier, cheaper, <laughs> um, whatever. And that actually that wasn't necessarily a system that was working well, but I, I didn't have really a language to explain why? I'd read all of the books, you know, debunking neoliberalism and looking at externalities and so on, but I couldn't really connect that to the regulatory system in which I was, you know, one, one small part. At the same time, um, in fact, almost exactly at the same time, um, there we had the, um, the tragic uh, uh, collapse of, the, of Rana Plaza, the um, textiles factory um, or workshop, sorry, in, um, in Dhaka in Bangladesh. My family is from um, Bangladesh originally. And again, it was this kind of moment where I started to think, but, but this is actually competition working at its best. Um, you know, this is a global um, uh, system of uh, efficiently seeking out the lowest labor costs and the lowest places to produce things. And then we transport these things, these textiles all over the world and we ship them and I'm wearing them here. And yet here are the costs. Um, we can see the harms of that system right there in front of us. How can we connect that to, you know, somebody like me there think operating what I think is in a system that's serving the public interest, you know, how can we possibly reconcile the public interest to these um, to to how competition policy works. What I started to understand is that actually, instead of structuring markets in the public interest, the way that competition policy has evolved is to diverge substantially from any understanding of the public interest. And that instead we are um, tweaking very much at the edges. And when I say investigating niche market failures, we investigate and hardly ever do anything about them. Often, you know, we may get on the front page of the Financial Times, you know, the European Commission has fined um, uh, Google a billion dollars or, or whatever, but no restructuring of the market. And I put approving mergers here because actually it should be reviewing, but hardly any mergers over the last 40 years have been blocked. Something like 0.5% of mergers is, 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 are blocked. So it's not really a review process. The com companies, and I know this because I advise them, they know that they're going to get their merger approved. It's just a question of when, how quickly, and what 
what possible deal they might have to stri strike with the competition authorities. Now, this is obviously not the way the competition community had been thinking about um, their system. So I'll get to, I, I'll come to that now. I, I think of this, the way that we have traditionally thought about competition policy as um, a competition policy idealism. Um, up until just a few years ago, if I asked a competition lawyer, what are the goals of, of um, antitrust of the competition policy system, they might have said something I, as I have here, which is um, what is stated in the UK Competition Markets Authority's um, mandate, which is to promote competition for the benefit of consumers. This is a long way of saying um, we are going to try to maximize consumer welfare. So if we look at the language that we are using, it's for the benefit of consumers, but it's this technical idea from economics of consumer welfare. And it, in practice, what that means, we take as a proxy, because we cannot measure consumer welfare directly, we take as a proxy, we're going to preference those forms of um, economic organization as taught to us by theoretical um, models within industrial organization economics, we are going to preference those types of um, economic activity that we believe will minimize prices and maximize output. And this is all in, in, um, in service of maximizing allocative efficiency and productive efficiency, which we think is a proxy for happiness. So this is an extremely tangential um, way of trying to maximize any type of public interest goal. But if there is a public interest goal, it is this very elusive idea of um, efficiency and ultimately um, the best allocation of resources across the economy and you know human happiness. So I would say this is an extremely idealistic policy area for that reason. And our model of operating is extremely indirect. You know, we don't go directly to try and maximize something. We try to maximize you know, several proxies away from it. And one would hope that if you are going to choose such a model, that you would be extremely alive to the indirect consequences because you are trying to influence something so indirectly. This model is also particularly vulnerable to the blind spots of neoclassical price theory on which it's based, in particular, um, an inability to really cost or grapple with the concept of uh, negative externalities in particular, um, a complete uh, kind of absence of any understanding or um, integration within to any of the models of distributional consequences, um, the assumption being that um, the distributional consequences will be dealt with kind of afterwards but, uh, by, by the state, or that they will be naturally dealt with by in ensuring that the best and most productive actors within the economy are best rewarded. And neoclassical price theory also has a very particular understanding of who this homo economicus, who this economic actor is, who is the, which com consumers are we trying to um, deal with? And we are almost always dealing with a kind of consumer that has been, um, uh, all of their personal attributes have been taken away. Um, and they are very much a consumer of now, um, not of the future, not of a future generation. Um, they're a consumer that is very focused on um, you know, material consumption and a consumer that has full information, etc. You know, the things that are, allow them to adequately go about and choose for themselves um, the best consumption choices. Now, if one were to embark upon such a an idealistic model, um, you would hope that we would gather lots of data and do lots of research um, and, and make sure that we are achieving our goal, however indirectly, that people are actually happier and that we are actually leading to the best um, economic uh, distribution of resources. And again, we would be asking ourselves constantly, are there any un unintended consequences? But we didn't do that um, at all. <laughs> um, so this is where what I talk about is competition policy, not idealism, but the realism. Not what do we think if you ask a competition lawyer or a competition economist, what are the goals of antitrust? That we've already seen their answer. Now we ask the question, what does antitrust or what does competition policy actually do? What does it do in the real world? What's its real world impact? So if we look at this goal, promotion of competition for the benefit of consumers, we have to ask ourselves, is this really the goal? And 
here I draw on the work of um, a, a renowned systems thinker and environmental um, scientist, Donella Meadows. She was part of the um, group, the Club of Rome, who in the 70s produced a, a very controversial and prescient report um, uh, outlining the limits to growth. So pointing out this, what now seems obvious point, which is that um, within a finite world, this idea of unlimited um, growth is extremely problematic. And they drew some alarming conclusions as to the, um, the speed with which our global ec economic system would collapse. But she's also, um, she didn't come at this just with just alarmism. She was looking at how do you influence a system which is on its path towards such um, a devastating outcome. And one of her um, contributions was to identify how do you actually um, distill what the goal of a system is. And she wrote that the goals of the system are not so much deducible from what anybody says, so what the competition lawyers think that they are doing, but rather from what the system actually does. And this is the question that I was asking myself, what does competition policy actually do? And this is what led to my um, light bulb moment of, of realizing that that I was on on working on the wrong side of that system. So if you imagine an objective observer, an alien who's come down from space and uh, comes onto Earth and is asking themselves, what is this system of competition policy that, that you guys have? Um, it might think that the goal is to proliferate competition law regimes around the world. We've had that over the last 30 years, um, going from you know just a, a dozen or so um, uh, major regimes to now over a hundred competition laws all around the world so it must be doing something good we would think because it's all because it's everywhere um the goal might be to create work for lawyers and regulators they are certainly extremely busy um and there's a lot of money flowing around that system um is the goal to just exchange a lot of documents because this is a kind of very resource intensive area of law um the the amounts the levels of discovery the amount of evidence that's collected in any given investigation um is enormous and an enormous amount of human kind of time and effort goes into um enforcing and defending this uh, against this system so an alien might think that that was the purpose. Is the purpose to approve things that were going to happen anyway? Because that's actually what's happened over the last 30 or 40 years. Business goes out to do something, they get to do it, but in between they have to sit in purgatory while the regulators um, ask them endless questions and ask for endless amounts of evidence. So is that the purpose of the system? Um, is the purpose of the system to generate fines? Because if we look at, in terms of success, we could look at the billions of euros of fines that have been levied um, and raised by the competition authorities. That in, in, from that sense, it's an extremely um, profitable business to go in and, and regulate and, um, and uh, enforce against competition infringements. So is that, would the alien think that would, the, would be the purpose? They might think that oh, they set up this purpose, this competition policy, in order to concentrate markets, because that is what we've seen has, has happened over the last 20, 30 years. We've seen a massive consolidation across almost every single sector, um, and just, that's despite kind of right underneath the noses of, of regulators and with their active approval. So is that really what this system is about? And maybe they would say they wouldn't, I don't think, come up with the idea of consumer welfare. And we'll talk about why um, they wouldn't think that this system benefits consumers. But they might think that it's quite good for the companies that are involved and that actually it might promote corporate welfare um, because more or less the system is designed to ensure um, exactly the types of outcomes that a corporate would want to achieve. And by the way, I'm not talking about some abstract version of competition policy. I'm talking about the specific version that we have right now, which has been um, evolved over the last 50 years, um, which some would call Chicago antitrust or the version of competition policy that's heavily influenced by the thinking of, um, of neoliberals with, from within the Chicago school, um, particularly in the 60s. And this, I think, is an interesting insight from Meadows. Um, even people within systems often don't rec don't often recognize what the whole system goal is that they are serving. So that was me. You know, there I am working away um, uh, to pulling all nighters in, in a corporate law firm, generally believing that you know every, every which is true, <laughs> every company has a right to defense, and you are wor working within a system that ultimately serves um, a, a good goal. But as a person within the system, it was extremely hard to see 
actually what that system was achieving. So now we have a new debate within the competition policy world, which is, should competition law take into account wider social goals? Um, this is a um, real soul searching exercise. Um, if you attend any competition law conference um, of the last five years and no doubt the next 10, um, this is ultimately what people are trying to get at, which is, you know, we have this system based on laws that are over 100 years old, um, heavily dispersed around the world. We're all doing it. Um, should we be taking into account all of these broader goals that as a species and as a global community, we will have to be thinking about sustainability, equality, democracy, um, the biggest problems of our times. Now, what should competition law have to say about that? My kind of um, trite answer is that the consequences for those things, democracy, sustainability, inequality, the consequences happen anyway. So we have to be able to say something. Either we directly take them into account or we must clean up our mess afterwards. And right now we do neither. So let's look at what's happened over the last um, 30, 40 years in terms of the outcomes of what this specific version of Chicago antitrust has actually created. And a lot of this evidence is really only, you know, we only have it at our fingertips now over the last two or three years. And this is not because the data has not been available, but because academics, economists, politicians, um, civil society, people have not been asking this question. What are, what are the implications? What's the connection between competition policy and these major um, uh, problems that we, we face? So at a very basic level, um, it's not hard to see that there might be a connection between competition policy and market um, concentration, since this is primarily the bread and butter of what competition policy is about. And what we see is various indicators of markups um, sorry, of, of rising concentration across the globe. So markups as one indicator. So the difference between um, uh, uh, price and cost, and we're seeing that markups have raised 30, ri risen 30% globally since 1980. We also see um, a trend of entrenchment of power. So the top decile of companies are more likely to stay in that top decile the following year, which means that you're not seeing the churn and this kind of Schumpeterian creative destruction um, on which our, our system is supposedly based. You're seeing an entrenchment of those at the top stay at the top. What are the implications for wages? Um, in 1980, the labor share of um, GDP was 66%. Now it's down to 59%. Now there are many um, causes for that. Um, globalization is one, technological change is another, but market concentration and market power over labor is also a factor. And overall, this means we're talking about a, um, a, a difference that is $6 trillion less going into the pockets of workers every year. This is from the research of Jan Akut um, and his book, The Profit Paradox. And monopoly concentration and monopsony power, buyer power over worker are, are causes. They're not the only causes, but importantly, Ekaut um, notes that antitrust is one of the few effective solutions, unless we're going to wind back technological change or wind back globalization, neither of which are entirely off the table, um, but certainly uh, antitrust has something to say or should have something to say about that change. What else? If we look at growth, again, from, um, Ikut's uh, work, we see that global GDP is nine to 10% lower than it would have been if we had the competitiveness um, of markets of, the, of 1980. That's $8 trillion less. So uh, when we think about how much we will have to spend to try and deal with climate change or to um, redistribute wealth and what that, how we might maintain our level of standard of living, $8 trillion would be um, a great thing to have lying around um, if we, if we had kept up the level of, of, of competition that we had in 1980, but instead we've had this massive um, level of concentration. What about inequality? Um, it's a, as a natural consequence of how a, a, a monopolist leverages its market power, the traditional way or the kind of uh, uncontroversial um, method is to raise your price to a monopoly, to earn a monopoly, which means typically that you are, um, charging a monopoly price and therefore there's a transfer from a consumer relatively 
um, uh, not wealthy to a shareholder, relatively wealthy, which means that you are transferring uh, by an estimate from the um, from the OECD um, 0.37 US dollars directly from the 90% poorest in the world to the 10% richest. So this is a contributor towards um, towards uh, inequality. Um, this is because, uh, as I say, that shareholding is heavily skewed towards the wealthy. And it also contributes to regional inequality um, and gender and racial inequality. And the reason is because monopolization is a centralizing force. You um, take money from the regions, from, um, from the provinces, and you channel it towards a central um, uh, corporate um, often headquartered in the financial center of whichever country and those profits go to shareholders that either are again within the financial center or much of that money flows offshore. What can we say about the impact on the climate and ecological crisis? Um, we actually can't say very much because there's been hardly any link, uh, any research on the link between these two uh, market failures between the market failure of monopoly power and the market failure of environmental um, externalities. And I've asked, you know, the chief economists at, at various competition agencies, um, and you know, am I missing something here? But there is really nothing on on this area, um, other than some kind of very theoretical work. So we don't know. So I will offer a principle as to why I think monopoly power might have something to do with the ecological crisis. And this is because we take the traditional idea, the monopoly, the monopoly power is power that's leveraged against consumers or monopsony by a power against suppliers. It's, it's natural to think that a company trying to maximize its profits and improve its level of power will also leverage that power against any other stakeholder it can, including over nature or the communities that seek to protect them. And it will also leverage its economic power into political power, which will allow it to avoid regulation. So we can start to build a theoretical connection, but as I say, on currently very little research on it. And if we look at, highly circumstantial evidence, we would say that over this era of Chicago antitrust, which runs rough, I mean, you could go all the way back to the 1930s, but really 1960, 1970 onwards, is the same you know, coexistent era of um, neoliberal capitalism in which we have deepened our ecological and climate crisis, and we have failed to do enough about it, while the corporations that have been responsible for much of the emissions and so on, have one um, done everything they can to hide the truth until um, until effectively forced to admit their their um, their involvement in in climate change. Often, even when they admit it and they promise that they're going to do something about it, at the same time they're lobbying against it. So they will um, agree to uh, to completely transform their business model while also um, spending um, hundreds of millions on lobbying against the Paris Agreement, for example. And highly circumstantial, but the biggest emitters or contributors towards the um, climate crisis tend to be oligopolist, ol oligopolistic um, markets or, or, or sectors. So I'm thinking of big oil, big agriculture, airlines, and I should have actually put finance in there because finance is the uh, you know, driver of, of, of many of those activities. This is linked to um, the last point on this slide, which is on democracy and political capture. So we have evidence that investors focus on companies that spend more on lobbying because um, they show a greater financial return. That's also quite intuitive. Um, and on the, uh, the kind of ability to lobby, um, concentrated industries are better all, uh, able to solve their collective action problem. So they are better able to um, uh, achieve common aims without direct coercion because they are few players um, trying to work towards those common aims together. Um, we have seen that in more um, uh, overt instances. Um, often it don't, happens through funding of um, research institutes and think tanks and so on. And you, know, you get many of these industry organizations that are behind the funding of, of various amounts of, of research. But sometimes it can be quite overt. This is not on the climate change um, example, but in the US, um, uh, in California, when there was a law that was being introduced about workers' rights for 
um, gig economy drivers, so drive Uber drivers, um, the two main companies operational in California, California Lyft um, and Uber, um, essentially banded together with an enormous public in, uh, public campaign um, to to ensure that that law didn't go through and they were successful. And um, the competition lawyers um, might be interested to think about, you know, is that a form of collusion that we should be looking at within even a traditional understanding of competition law? Um, because effectively they are colluding in order to uh, impact the market. But more broadly, it shows this ability that if there are kind of only a few players, um, they are better able to, to achieve common outcomes. So if we then now come again to ask ourselves, you know, what is it that this Chicago, Chicago antitrust, what does it do at a conceptual level? Um, I have come to an understanding, this is what my work it has informed my work and, and my book, is that effectively competition law, if you don't have a, a, an overt industrial strategy, then competition law is your default in industrial strategy. It determines who gets to collude and who gets the privilege of being able to merge and concentrate and which actors within the economy are forced to compete. And it has an inbuilt preference towards mergers and the activities of monopolies and a distinct distaste for cartels of small um, disempowered and um, uh, dispersed businesses and individuals. So we see this in the um, the fact that hardly any mergers are blocked by big corporates, but on the other hand, um, you know, the commission goes after um, uh, cartels of orchestra players and um, cleaners who are trying to collectively bargain their wages. We also see this in the kind of very limited exemptions that are provided to farmers to um, uh, create farmer cooperatives. The assumption is that collusion is bad unless you are a big corporate and then you are allowed to merge and effectively collude with your rivals on the assumption that you will generate such compensating efficiencies and such benefits to um, consumers that, that that type of activity should be allowed. And what we've seen in the last few slides is that those benefits to consumers have not materialized. If anything, we've seen the opposite. An important point to note is, you know, why, am, why are we talking about um, antitrust law or competition law in the context of these huge um, social problems? It's because it's an extremely powerful tool and one with extremely powerful remedies. Um, I say it's largely ignored. What I mean there is by um, civil society, by um, the democratic state, companies take competition law extremely seriously because we're talking about you know, finding powers of the commission to find up to 10% of global turnover. If the commission starts knocking at your door, corporates pay attention. And that is not necessarily true for every regulatory agency. So it is an important leverage point in which if we wanted to apply pressure for the public interest, we might be well advised to do so. And the other point is that what did Chicago Antitrust do? Well, it did a lot. It did a lot over the last 30, 40 years. We can draw a link between the way that this niche area of, of law operated and some of the big macro trends that we can see in the world. And it is therefore, I find myself in the kind of bizarre position, although it's potentially informed by my previous um, uh, Thatcherite <laughs> existence, I find myself agreeing with somebody who I wouldn't think that given where I come from and the type of work I'm doing, which I'll explain in a minute, I wouldn't think I would agree with Milton Friedman. Um, but he said, I've gradually come to the conclusion that antitrust, antitrust does far more harm than good, and we'd be better off if we didn't have it at all, if we got rid of it. Now, he's obviously talking about something else. He's talking about a highly interventionist model of competition policy where the regulators are out there blocking mergers and so on. But that is not the model of competition policy that we actually have. That's the bogeyman that he, want, he wanted us to be scared of um, and it worked. And in fact, the version that does more harm than good and we'd be better off if we didn't have it at all is the Chicago antitrust model, which Friedman and others like Robert Bork and his contemporaries did a lot to promote. So we come back to this question of, you know, the competition lawyers, policymakers are asking ourselves themselves, you know, what about these other social goals? Some of them are sustainability, inequality, racial diversity, etc. Should competition law have something to say about it? Well, it does do something 
in relation to those anyway. So we better have some answer to what are we gonna do about it? Should we be looking at those things directly? You know, should we incorporate them within our tests that we apply um, within a merger, for example, of whether the merger should be approved? Should we look at it in terms of how we define power um, when we're looking at abuse of dominance? Um, these are all live questions um, to which I have um, answers that are not uncontroversial. Um, and we should also be asking ourselves, you know, how can we make sure that this system, which is so um, powerful, uh, causes less harm, even if it doesn't try to do um, more good. And I think those are two important questions that we should be asking ourselves. And the example I use in this is um, a current kind of hot topic within the competition law world is this idea of sustainability agreements. So we must achieve um, a radical reduction in emissions over the next five, 10, 15 years, um, or, or sooner than that, really. Um, Business is saying, in order for us to do that, then we must not be held to the rigors of competition. You must allow us to collaborate with our rivals so that we may um, introduce more energy efficient production processes. We may use packaging that is better. It uses fewer um, resources, um, et cetera, et cetera. And so the emphasis is on competition law getting out of the way, the idea that if um, I were to, if I was a major um, fast moving consumer goods company, for example, and I was to try to collaborate with my major rival, that the next thing that would happen is the commission knocking on my door. So they're asking for exemptions. Now, if we think about all of the things that competition law has achieved so far, this version as Chicago antitrust version, I would say we must be extremely wary of, of of entrenching further power. So is it the case that the collaboration between those big corporates is a transformational lever through which we can achieve um, sustainability? I would say no. I would also say that it is potentially going to make the problem worse. You give further power, collusive power to the exact companies that have some link to getting us into this problem in the first place. And so this is why I, I've said that it's possibly a form of a kind of, it's a power grab dressed up as cultural, uh, co corporate social responsibility. We have this idea that we're going to do more good, but whatever you do, let us do more. Um, and that is effectively taking away from the democratic sphere, um, the ability for um, other actors to intervene. So now I come to kind of what next and what I, personally I'm doing about it. Um, uh, as Cathy mentioned, I'm the co-founder of an organization called the Balanced Economy Project, which I formed um, with my, my co-founder is uh, 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 someone called Nick Shackson, who is a financial journalist with a tax justice background, but also a, a background in, in growing movements. And we have come at this problem with, with kind of two prongs, I suppose. One is the conceptual. So our goal is to try and um, articulate and, um, and evidence what we call the system of monopoly. So as compared to this understanding that competition law and policy is neutral, it just intervenes in these very select circumstances to try and tweak capitalism. We argue that actually we have an entire legal, financial and economic system that concentrates wealth and power and facilitates the creation of monopolies. And this goes beyond competition law. We could look at securities law. We could look at tax. Um, we could look at um, corporate law itself and the, um, the imperatives of shareholder value, for example. And we could look at how law firms work and their, their incentive structures. We could look at who um, is involved in the decision making. This is an entire kind of system that we, we aim to over the next few years um, really flesh out and explain how, the, how this has led to all of the harms that I've mentioned. At a very practical level, in terms of kind of organizing, um, we hope to build what we call the missing infrastructure of competition policy. So this is the question of answering the question of how could we possibly have gotten to where we are, where um, you know, smart people were <laughs> armed with cutting edge um, tools and understanding of the law um, have 
gone down so far into a path that is so far away from the public interest. And one of the reasons that we believe that that has happened is that we don't have an infrastructure of competition policy that invites in the voices of stakeholders, of those who might actually be harmed by some of this conduct. Um, they're completely absent. So if you, um, when we talk to, say, for example, um, Tommaso Valletti, who is the former chief economist of DG Comp um, uh, at the Commission, and he says, you know, in his tenure, he was never at the table with civil society or with stakeholders actually talking to them about, um, about uh, a merger, for example. Um, and on the other hand, he's very regularly facing the corporate law firms who, who defend um, uh, the interests of the, of the big corporates. And so there is a kind of mismatch in terms of, um, of who is at the table. Now, that's not, actually written into the law <laughs> I mean, it doesn't it doesn't necessarily say that one party gets gets a, a right to be there and another doesn't although we've done much to um push it in that direction but the infrastructure is missing partly because um competition lawyers and maybe you think i have been doing so during this presentation too um speak their own language they um don't really invite um collaborations or or um or uh, you know academic work across different legal areas, economic areas, areas through political theory. It's been an extremely purist um, understanding of what's relevant to antitrust law. Um, and therefore, a lot of those perspectives are missing, both in the academic community, but also certainly um, when it comes to, you know, democratic discourse. So those are the kind of two big elements of what, um, of what I'll be working on over the next few years. Um, I'm going to pause there. I can see that already there are some kind of hands up and questions. I'm really delighted to, to kind of talk about this and, um, and excited to, to continue the conversation. So hopefully I've stimulated some, some, uh, some good questions and we can have a nice discussion now. So thank you.